Church, welcome to our publishing day. My name is Mrs. Nikito from the publishing department. Our theme today is a printed page. Let's talk about printed page, the qualities of printed page. A printed page one, it never tires. A printed page two, it never flanches. A, a printed page never loses temper. A printed page travels cheap. 
it keeps alive even if we are long dead. Even if the printer is long, is long gone, but the printed page keeps alive. If you burn a publishing, a publisher prints again. If you burn pub, a publisher prints again. The printed page visits is a visitor that goes in and never comes out unless you carry it somewhere else. It sticks, it sticks to its word. It never changes its word. Even if it's printed, no one is, it never, it never alters itself. It enters closed doors. It reaches to those whose religion doesn't allow to go to church. You know, we have a lot of people um, that don't allow their family members to go to church because uh, they believe in some, some of them are, they believe in ATR, some of them they believe in Buddhism and so on. So for us to be able to take that printed page to those people, uh, we, just, we just deliver the printed page and it works itself. Uh, the other point, it reaches an intellectual student. Written word, not easily to destroy. Let's read, let's get into the Bible and read um, Isaiah 40, verse 8. It reads, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. That's how the printed page is. It stands forever. Do you know that uh, in the Dark Ages, if you remember, if you're a reader like me, in the Dark Ages, uh, many people died for this printed page, but it survived. Many people used to carry it in, in, they used to bake bread and put the printed page inside. It, um, the Romans tried to destroy that printed page, but it was never destroyed. That's how a printed page is. When and where is it suitable? In my neighborhood, printed page. You know, we have neighbors that we talk to, good morning, good afternoon, evening, but we have never given them a printed page. We are supposed as Adventists to give our neighbors the printed page, a basket. You know, um, we have those less privileged. When, whenever we, we put our basket uh, of food, we have to also put printed page inside, a Bible, a book, a magazine. Choose a territory ar around your home, visit and share literature that tells our beliefs, and also have some for children. You know, we have a tendency of just giving uh, adults um, free literature. We also have free literature for, for, for the little kids. Remember, those are the church of tomorrow, even if they are, if they are pre-Adventists. You know, by preaching to them, uh, by giving them um, quarterlies, uh, we have storybooks in the publishing ministries. We have a lot, a variety of storybooks for children. We can buy those storybooks, and we can also give the children when we are giving the adults, we also have to give the children theirs. And as the time goes on, you see they'll start coming to church. Why? Because you also involve them. When you give, when you give children um, their literature, you know, they feel special. And when they feel special, where they are, where they are made important, they come there and they enjoy, they grow inside our church. You know, where else can we, where else can we, can we give off free literature? Special events of our lives, like weddings. You know, there's this one wedding that I remember that a person gave free literature. You know, I enjoyed that, that wedding because there was free literature on that wedding. It was my first to see that. And, and you know, I got so excited Free literature was, gi was given on that wedding. And the cake also spoke of, our, of, of what we believe. No, we don't go to political rallies, but 
if you are near, you can, you can give free literature, free tracks to them as they leave their rallies. Um, which books can we give them? Desire of Ages, Health and Wellness, um, Acts of the Apostles, The Great Controversy. There is, there is a greater number of books that we can give and our book of the year, Hopeful Travel Times. Those books are the books that we can give every time, wherever we are and wherever we go. At work, let it be literature tracks. At church, literature rack. At every church, let there be a literature rack so that when people are getting in, into the church, they pick um, a tract or, or a book of the year. When they are going out, they also do the same thing. We have seminars that we do whether at church or in our workplaces. Let it be free literature as well. Uh, in our churches, the interest coordinators, the interest coordinators should have a list of visitors so that those visitors, so that you can make, make a plan to give visitors free literature, not only magazines. And as we are giving the magazines, let, let us not give the magazines of uh, 2018 when, when we are in 2021. Let's give the, the, the magazines of 2021 and add the books that will, and add the books that tell them of what we believe, of our beliefs. Ashes, ashes, ashes. Ashes should have free literature. You know, when, we, when, you, when you give a smile, give a smile, give a free literature. You know, that's how it should be. When you give a smile as an usher, you also have to give what? Free literature. Church schools. You know, we have a problem with our church schools. One thing that they never thought of, we should have free literature in our church schools. All Adventist schools should have free literature. As parents come, as, as parents come to pay their school fees, to see their children, they should also be given those free literature. You know, we have people that are not Adventist, but they like our schools. We have parents that like our schools, but which are not Adventist. We also have to have free literature for those parents so that when they come, they know of our belief. When they read that literature, they know of our what? Of our beliefs. And at our schools, whether day school or boarding school, we have to have our manual beliefs and also hymn books and also the Bibles. Those three things go hand in hand, especially in high schools. We should have the Bible beliefs. Every student should have Bible belief, um, hymn book, and a Bible. So that when they leave our schools, some way, somehow, two years, three years down the line, they will remember what they were taught. And they will come, and they will come to what they were taught the truth, to where they were taught the truth, sorry. Our Sabbath school council, we should distribute literature to classes to go and distribute during the week and also bring a report the next, the next Sabbath. You know, we have a problem, we have a problem right now with our um, Sabbath school cards. You know, there are no free literature distributed. What is going on? Is um, Sabbath School Council, we need to make an arrangement so that we get free literature at our East Zimbabwe Conference or North Zimbabwe Conference. There are free literature there. You can get those free literature. Or as a church, you can, you can organize funds for you to be able to buy those free literatures for you to be able to buy literature that you can give out to people. Like, um, hope for the trouble times is dollar for two. So why not do that as a church? You know, we have a great commission. Go ye therefore. So we should go ye therefore. How? We teach. We preach to them. We teach them the truth. Then we baptize. 
How can we baptize when we don't even, when we don't even give free literature, when we don't even go out there and have um, um, Bible studies with them? And one other thing, as an Adventist, you should know what you believe. As an Adventist, I repeat, you should know what you believe. If, as long as I know what I believe, I also, has, I also have the strength to go out there and, and share with someone the good news that I have read. You cannot just read and keep what you have read inside. You cannot do that. When you read something, when you understand it, you also would like to share. And that person shares with somebody else. And that person, the next person shares as well. And, the, and then the truth is out there. That's how we should do as Adventists, as the publishing ministry. Our goal is for every member of the church to give out literature. God is, is sending us to people who don't know the truth. People, God would love to hear a person that says, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. I'll say what you want me to say. That's how an Adventist should respond, should respond to, our, to the Great Commission. Thank you. I would like to, to pray to end our Sabbath school lesson. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for the lesson that was before us. Lord Jesus, as your, as your church members, that knows the truth. May you help us and give us the, the strength to do what you want us to do, to go where you want us to go. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. In the harvest fields now repent, there is a work for all to do. Half the voice of God is calling to the heart.
beloved in the name of our living and victorious Jesus Christ. My name is Shepa Desrangarera and today we will be looking at lesson nine of our lesson study. Before we begin let us summon the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father thank you so much for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our weary paths. We ask that Lord as we delve into your lesson that you have given us as food, as food that is meat for the weak we ask that, Lord God, we may come out with gems that strengthen us in our Christian walk. May glory and honor be given to you because you are a loving and caring God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's get straight into it. Our lesson is lesson nine. And the theme that we have is turn their hearts. Now, I, I found this lesson very, very interesting, very touching and very thought provoking. Well, let's look at our memory text, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. It says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Our Sabbath begins with the knowledge or with the fact that we are all sinful. As we are reminded in Romans chapter 3 verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. One thing we need to understand is that God does not leave us in the, in the depths of this hopelessness because it is in verse 24 of chapter two, uh, 3 of Romans that tells us that, uh, if we are um, that we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So there is confidence that if we acknowledge our sin and are sorry for it and ask for God's forgiveness and turn away from it, we enjoy redemption through Christ Jesus. Isn't that encouraging? And of course, if we move to Sunday, we get the interesting topic, me ye ten. 
Now, I'm no Hebrew scholar, but this was an interesting lesson for me because it talks about this being a, a, a used idiom throughout the Bible, a Hebrew idiom that is used to express a feeling of desire, a strong need. And here we are told that when it is translated literally, it means who will give. Now, we hear these regrets or desires when the children of Israel faced challenges in the wilderness and said, me yitin. Now, they had suffered in the wilderness and they cried out and said, we had died, uh, that we, we wish or we desire or who will give that we had died in the Lord's hand in Egypt. They regretted. And we also face this uh, idiom, me uh, yitin, when Job was in the depth of persecution, when he was ill and everything around him was being destroyed. He calls out me yitin and he cries for death in his immense pain. However, something interesting occurs. God himself is found to say this similar phrase, but this is an all powerful God, the creator God, the super seeding, the, the most powerful being that we have ever known. And that is only known to man or mankind comes out crying out these words. And we find them in Deuteronomy specific, uh, chapter five, specifically verse 29, where the sovereign creator expresses me yitin. And he says, oh, that there was such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. God speaks as if he had no power. And yet clearly, this verse shows us that God cannot trample on free will, no matter how it even hurts him. God allows us to make choices. The writer tells us that just as we humans are free to sin, we are also free to, or given freedom to choose the Lord by responding to his spirit, repenting and following him. The choice is always ours and ours alone. And God, no matter how much it hurts him, allows us to make these choices. Monday. Monday talks about or is under the title, Seek Me and Find Me. We are reminded that God knows everything, that he has foreknowledge, yet though he possesses this power, he shares with the Israelites expected actions, the things that they would do. He foretells them, this is what you will do when you get to the promised land. But even if he has this foreknowledge, he still beckons them, come. He beckons man to come and to seek and find him, for he desires to forgive and he desires to restore them. But only and only if they repent or return. And that takes us to Tuesday. Tuesday gives us an interesting term, teshuva. Teshuva comes from the word or means to turn. In, in all clarity, it is to return. Now, it's a simple equation that God gives us. It says that where we mess up, terrible consequences will arise for you and your family for the wages of sin is indeed death. However, if we teshuva, that is, if we turn or return, we are restored. I want you to understand that Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 10 says, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, God is waiting for you to turn. And we are told in, on the date of Wednesday, that with all your heart. Isn't that interesting? Repentance is an all or nothing issue. It is a serious issue where God does not compromise or does not want a half-baked cake. He wants a full commitment from the Christian. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse, I mean chapter 30, verse 1 to 10 talks about the conditions or components of true repentance. Number one, if we return with all our heart, if we teshuva with all our heart. And number two, if we obey him with all our heart. Because if our hearts are in line with God, are right with God, our actions will follow. Listen, true repentance is more than sorrow for sin. This is what Ellen White says. It is a resolute turning away from evil. That is from Patriots and Prophets, um, page 557. 
Ellen White emphasizes that true repentance is a complete thing, an all or nothing thing. Now, Thursday emphasizes to, uh, for us to repent and be converted. Here, the writer directs our attention to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, particularly verse 2 and 8. John the Baptist beckons the children of Israel to repent, to repent from their sin. And he adjures them to bear the fruit befitting of the kingdom, much like we see in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And even throughout the New Testament, Jesus himself emphasizes and invites us to make the conscious choice to put away those sins, relying wholly on the merits of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, after Peter calls out the nation for crucifying Jesus, many of the people, the Bible tells us, are cut to the heart and they seek to know what must we do? We need to understand that Paul tells them in verse 38 to repent. That is profound. That Paul tells them at the moment they realize that they were indeed responsible for crucifying their savior. And they desired, they were at the feet of mercy, desiring to know a way out. Paul calls them to repentance. This reminds me of Judas and David. This comparison is important in our Christian walk. For you remember, David, when he realized his sin, wanted to know what he ought to do. And he turns to the Lord and he says, create within me a clean heart, O Lord. Purify me, but don't cast me from your presence. That is repentance. However, Judas Iscariot is remorseful. He feels bad for what he's done. And guess what he does? He takes the situation into his own hands and kills himself. What a sad story. And that reminds us of the difference between repentance and remorsefulness. Friday concludes with an emphasis of further thoughts that we must think about as we look at this, at this issue of repentance. When we are on the path to repentance, Ellen White says, we shall make the apostles' confession our own. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That is Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. The apostle Paul further says that, God forbid that I should glory, save only in the cross, of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Brethren, my sisters, I'd like for us to turn to our memory text, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Be encouraged this week as we turn our hearts, as we teshuva back to Christ. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth and the strength we gain from knowing that you have loved us with a love that does not give up. That you, though knowing the future of our actions, still beckon us to come and turn to you. Lord God, we are so sorry for how we have done you wrong in the past. And we come to you this day and seek that you strengthen us, strengthen us in our repentance from sin, that we may resolve and give ourselves wholly to you. In your word, you say, submit to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Lord God, we submit therefore to you. We repent from our sin. We do not look for our own methods to make right, but we look for you to help us from the devil so that all may be well and that we may be called your children even as you desire. May your name be blessed and may you bless us, your children, in this walk of faith and never let go of us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Be blessed.
Uzieta rajes di no mira una jesu di di
boys and girls my name is misty and i am back again with another same one guys i hope you guys had a great week because uh mine was okay i had a great week i had fun at work it was really amazing i hope you guys had fun at um at school so our someone for today is coming from the book of john chapter 18 verse 34 and you know what a story is told of two guys so the older one was Tino and the little one was Sam. So mom bought a new bike. Mom and dad bought a new bicycle for Tino and Tino was very happy. He would ride his bicycle to and from uh, school, playing with his friends. It was really fun. And you know when um, Sam was old enough to get a bicycle, mom bought a new bicycle for Sam. And you know what happened? Tino was um, very jealous. She was like, how can mom buy a new bicycle for my little brother? You know, I'm the old brother and my bicycle is old and she didn't buy a new bicycle for me. She's not fair. Ha, ah, you know, I was thinking of all those bad, bad, bad and negative um, thoughts. So you know what happened? So the night when everyone else was asleep, Tino you know, woke up and he was like, ha, huh? it's really not fair that my little brother has a nice bicycle and now everyone in the neighborhood is looking at him they think he's cooler than me oh what should i do and you know what he did mm, it was very evil so tino woke up and then he took a scissors do you know scissors guys what do you use the scissors for cut papers yes exactly that's right so tino took um the scissors and he went to the garage where the bicycles were and you know what he did Mm, it was very bad. So, you know what he did with his scissors? Ah, he said, he said, you know, he said, he said, what's this? You know, with, with the scissors. He was doing this to the wheels of the bicycle. Yes, and he was doing that with an angry face. And he was like, he won't ride this bicycle ever again. He won't ride this bicycle ever again. Mm, that was very evil, you know. So, you know, after doing all that, after destroying his little brother's bicycle, Tino went back inside and then he slept. And when he woke up in the morning, um, mom called him. Mom was like, Tino, Tino, Tino was like, um, yes, mom, what's up? Mom was like, Tino, what happened to Sam's bicycle? Tino was like, mom, you were saying Sam's bicycle, so how am I supposed to know? You know what? That still reminds me of a certain story in the Bible from the book of Genesis. So there's a story of two boys. Uh, do you know the, the boys? Anyone who wants to try these guys were brothers. Anyone? Did someone say Cain and Abel? Exactly, Cain and Abel. And you know what happened, guys? Hmm. Cain was very jealous of his little brother Abel because God had told him that, guys, if you want to bring sacrifices, you need to bring a lamp. A lamp. Yes, a lamp. And you know what the lamp uh, stood for? Do you? All right, so the lamb back then stood for Jesus was supposed to come as the sacrificial lamb. And even up to today, Jesus is the, is the lamb to sacrifice for us, right? Isn't Jesus died for us, guys? You know that, right? Exactly, you guys are brilliant. All right, so God had told them that. And you know what happened? Abel obeyed God and he went to God with his offering. He gave it to God and God really accepted the lamb because God was happy because Abel had listened to God. And do you know what Cain did? Cain was like, uh, okay, I'll just take my vegetables. After all, these vegetables are nice. They are fresh. They are okay. So I'll just take them to God and then I'll give them to God. But God had told them that, guys, you need to bring a lamp, not vegetables. So Cain went with the vegetables, and when he got there, you know, he sacrificed the vegetables. But God did not accept the vegetables because God had told them that they were supposed to bring a lamp. So when that happened, Cain was very jealous. He's like, hmm, have you ever guys been angry? Have you ever been angry at one point in time? Yes, that face you made when you were angry. That's the exact face which she came at. She was like, hmm, how can God deny my offering when he is accepting my little brother's offering? It is not fair. It is not fair. And it is not fair. Therefore, I am going to deal with my little brother because God did not deal fairly with me. So Cain said, Abel, let's go to the fields. And then they went to the forest. And you know what happened? Cain killed his little brother Abel. Why? Because of jealous guys. So our sermon for today, guys, coming from the book of John. I said from the book of John. Do you remember the chapter? 
anyone who remembers the chapter anyone anyone yes it's john 13 and the verse is verse 34 so the bible reads a new commandment i give unto you that you love one another as i have loved you and that you also love one another you know jesus had to repeat that you guys have to love one another so boys and girls we don't want boys and girls who are like cain who will be jealous of their brothers and when you see a little brother you know doing well at school and then you are jealous you want to tear their report up or you maybe you see your friend she's a new dress your mom bought a new dress from uk and you're like hmm, how can my tipa have a new dress when i don't have a new dress that is so not fair. and then you take mud then you pour mud on your on her dress it's not nice we should never be like that so for such a time as this god is looking for boys and girls who have love in their hearts god is looking for boys and girls who are willing to love each other so how do we love each other anyone who wants to try how do you love each other yes by sharing our toys with them yes by sharing our books with them exactly by not saying grumpy words to them by not being rude to them we should be nice to each other we should learn to love our friends that right boys and girls and we should also learn to love our parents and to obey our parents because you know what whenever whenever you're at home and you want to do something bad up to your little brother or your little sister or your big brother or your big sister mom will be like tino don't do that matipa has a little sister tino don't do that Cooper has a little brother i'm sure mom always say that at home so boys and girls always remember that whatever you do in life god is watching and you know what what really hates me from the story of cain and abel is that when god asked um cain and god said cain where's the little brother abel just like uh tino the big brother cain said god how am i supposed to know am i his keeper now like cain was questioning god that god are you asking about my brother am i his keeper now so boys and girls listen up we should never be rude to our parents to god or to anyone because Cain was actually supposed to apologize and say, God, maybe I just have to say, God, I'm really sorry. You know, I, I killed my, I don't know what exactly we're supposed to say because he had done something wrong because killing is bad. But anyway, guys, we are supposed to admit your mistakes. And you know what happened? Instead of admitting his mistake, Cain actually was grumpy to God. He was rude to God. He's like, um, am I his keeper now? I'm sure we have boys and girls here who are like that. They, they are always grumpy, their parents, they are, they are rude to their parents. When mom says, um, Tino, spread your bed, Tino will be like, shh, you're like I'm the maid here. Yeah, I know you guys, I know you, but that is a very bad habit. We should always be nice and we should always obey our parents and always remember that Jesus told us that we should always, always and always have love in our hearts. We should learn to love others because if you hate others, then you become like certain and you become a bad person. So always remember that when you want to do something bad to someone, when you want to do something bad to your friend, to anyone in your class, when you want to say any 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 grumpy words, you want to say any rude words to anyone, always remember that you are being like Cain and being like Cain is not right. So for today, we want to pray asking God to help us that as boys and girls may be able to live according to God's will and that as boys and girls we may not be grumpy we may not be rude and we may be nice our friends is it boys and girls yes yeah, so if there is any one of us who's saying God help me I want to be able to to be nice to my friends I don't want to be grumpy I want to be a person who plays well with others if you're like that then lift up your hand as I am praying, let's pray together. So we are now praying to our kind and loving Father in heaven. We would like to thank you, Jehovah, for the gift of life. Thank you so much for being our Lord and our God. Help us, Lord, to have love in our hearts. May we never be grumpy. May we never be rude. And may we always be nice to each other. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So boys and girls, that was our sermon for today. Always remember that Misty doesn't like grumpy kids and Misty doesn't like rude boys and girls. Yes, exactly. I don't like anyone who's rude. Yes, I want all of you guys to be nice to each other, to play well with each other and to resemble the character of Christ. Isn't boys and girls? 
So from Misty, it's goodbye. Until next time, I will see you and uh, enjoy the rest of your Sabbath. Bye from me.
to dread, whatever to fear, meaning only everlasting arms. I have blessed. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. It is another Sabbath where we enjoy the blessings of the Lord. It is another Sabbath where we meet together and worship him who created the heavens and the earth. Allow us to pray before we get into the message of the day. Our Father who is in heaven, may you speak to us, challenge and change us to be better people. In your name I pray. Amen. We are reading from the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 to verse 20. The Bible from the King James Version will read, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. May the good Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now, the Bible is introducing us to a scenario when Jesus is charging his disciples. It is introducing us to a scenario when Jesus is giving to his disciples his last message. It is introducing us to a situation when Jesus is telling the disciples what to do as they'll be waiting for his second coming. So the Bible introduces us to a savior or a departing savior who is giving his followers a message of departure. You know, many a times when it comes to the African mindset, we value the last words of somebody who is dying, but yet the Bible is teaching us to value the words of a savior who is going and coming back. Allow me to say to you, my brothers and sisters, if you have ever valued a message, why not value the message? of somebody who is going and is to be coming back. Now the Bible, allow me to take uh, one or two words from the verses that we have read. Allow me to take the word, go ye therefore and teach. Now the Bible, when it talks about teaching, let me introduce you to the world of teachers. Teachers, they don't just teach. Number one, they make use of a syllabus. When we talk about a syllabus, it is the guiding principle of what they are supposed to teach and of what will, is to be expected for the students or when the students will be writing their examinations. So when the Bible is telling us about teaching, the first thing that we have to remember is that there should be a syllabus. So that's number one, there should always be a syllabus which will give us the guiding principle as to what we want. So when the Bible is saying, go ye therefore and teach all nations, it is introducing us to teaching the all nations with a syllabus which is there or a syllabus which Christ himself has given us. You will never charge us to go without giving us a syllabus to use uh, when we go. Now number two, when we talk about going to teach all nations or when we talk about going uh, to teach, we don't just use a syllabus. Number two, we use one what we call the teaching skills. Every teacher has a skill. Now, not all students will hear you when you shout and write on the board. So there is supposed to be some certain skill that will make you applicable to everyone or that will make your message or your teaching be heard by every student in the class. So, 
The Bible is saying, in as much as we should go and teach, in as much as we should go out to the world to evangelize, in as much as we should go out to reach out to the world, we need to have a certain skill, the teaching skills. We need to have skills that will make the audience understand what we want to give them. That will make them the, the, the audience relate to, want, to what we want to educate them on. That will make the audience be in, in a relationship with the subject matter of the day. Number three, when we talk about teaching, it's not only about the skill of teaching, it's not only about the syllabus, but we also have textbooks that are used in teaching. Now, allow me to say, in as much as we have the syllabus, in as much as we might have the skill, we need the textbook which will give us uh, the, the, the syllabus in detail. We need the textbook which will give us the teaching skill in detail. We need the textbook which will give us more examples and advices as to how we should relate with the learner or with the student uh, that we are teaching. So when the Bible is saying, go ye therefore and teach all nations, it is already employing not only preachers, not only teachers, but it is also employing those that create the syllabus or those that are good with designing the syllabus. It is not only employing those that are good with designing the syllabus, but it is also employing those that are gifted in writing, those that are gifted in putting words into paper so that they can give a, a, a clear textbook uh, to the students so that they can give a teacher's manual or a textbook to the teacher so that whenever he, is, he or she is relating with the student, they have somewhere to refer or they have a book uh, to refer to so that they can teach all nations. Allow me to say... Uh, to you, my brothers and sisters, this morning, many a times we have taken uh, the department of publishing for granted, yet forgetting that it is in this department where the syllabus to Christianity is designed. It is in this department even where the Bible, which is one of the greatest syllabuses, is found in publishing. It is in publishing where textbooks are manufactured and created so that the work of the Lord can be easier for a student. Now when we talk about a teacher, we are not only talking about a textbook to use, we are also talking about number four, a revision, a textbook. In the Bible or biblically, we are talking about the revised as edition. But when it comes to teachers, we are talking about a revision textbook which comes with questions and answers so that it can prepare the students not only uh, for the class but also for an examination that is coming. Remember, remember, when a teacher teaches, they don't end in teaching. They also give quizzes. They also give exercises. They also give tests or examinations. That means we need something again to use in revision so that when the student is preparing for the final examination, they can have somewhere that will equip them or that will make them ready for the final examination. So there is more need of that a revised edition. Number five, when we talk about teaching, we cannot talk about teaching from the syllabus. We cannot talk about this teacher with the skill. We cannot talk about uh, the textbook. We cannot talk about uh, the revision part of it. We also have to be conscious that after the textbook, after the syllabus, after the teacher, after a revising and the textbook, we have an examination. So we need again those that will create uh, the mock examinations in preparation uh, for the final examination. We need those uh, that will be uh, um, setting the final examination so that uh, the student uh, can have something to write on. We need those with experience to help us in that. Not only do we need those who set the exams, we need those who mark uh, the exams so that 
uh, the, the student can see their results, how they've performed from what they've learned uh, during uh, the term or during the semester or during the years that they have been uh, pursuing the academic life. So you'd see that when we talk about uh, teaching or when we talk, when we introduce teaching, we are talking about a whole department that is in the Adventist church or that is in the Christian world where we talk about publishing. Allow me to submit to you, uh, my brothers and sisters, that publishing is one of the backbones of the church. Why? Because it is in publishing where we preserve and present the morality of the church. It is in publishing where we, we summarize everything that has been said so that we can bring about something that is unique and that is small and that can manage uh, to elevate a believer or a non-believer. Allow me to say, when the Bible is saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It does not end there. It continues and gives us another teaching. It says, and teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. It now says, after teaching, we are not just teaching them to have the knowledge. We are not just teaching the people and uh, equipping them intellectually, but the Bible is saying we are teaching them to observe all things. Allow me to say to you, my brothers and sisters, observing all things is not an overnight thing. Just like education is not an overnight thing, we start from ECDA up to university. We continue. I don't know the highest uh, place where we can uh, finally end, but allow me to say, in as much as teaching or learning is a process, so is teaching a process. Allow me to say, one way or the other, for believers to advance in Christianity, they need to continuously learn. How can they learn when in seven days, only one day they are gathered for worship and the other six days they are somewhere? How will they learn? And how will they know how to observe? That's where we introduce uh, the textbook. Allow me to take one skill from the teachers. When they teach, they also give you something that is called a take-home assignment or a homework uh, that you would have to do when you are not with others. But now allow me to say, for the answers of the homework to be accurate and correct, you need a textbook. You need somewhere to refer uh, from. You need somewhere uh, where you can still read and say, surely the answer is very correct. That's where we are saying you need that textbook. Let me talk uh, to others uh, this morning. You might look at yourself and think whatsoever you are writing, it doesn't make sense. But let me challenge you to say, the world is waiting for that textbook. Probably it's a book about family life. The world is waiting for that. Probably it's a book about the social life. The way world is waiting for that textbook. Uh, probably it's about stewardship. The world is waiting for that textbook. Probably it's about gr grief. Uh, the world is waiting for that textbook. Maybe it's about Christian entrepreneurship. The world is waiting for that textbook. Why? Because we are living in those things day and night and and somewhere, somehow, we don't have anywhere to refer to. Sometimes we end up waiting for the Sabbath or waiting for the day of gathering. Yet it might come too late. Maybe I've met a challenge on a Sunday. Maybe waiting for Sabbath might be uh, too long and others will end up uh, committing suicide. Why not give us the textbooks which God has deposited into you? We want to use them for teaching. We want to use them for preaching. We want to use them 
to refer to them so that they help us to simplify the syllabus, so that they help us to simplify the word of the Lord from the Bible, so that they help us to simplify the word of the Lord even from the spirit of prophecy. Why not give us something uh, so that we might live a better life, so that we might, uh, we might relate with your experience. You might not write about something difficult. Probably you're writing about your experience as a Christian. That is a need. Somebody is failing uh, to move off that experience. They are waiting uh, for your textbook. Allow me to challenge us, uh, brothers and sisters, as we are talking about publishing. This year we have a book of the year that we are to be distributing. That's another textbook. We need to leave it with the people. Allow me to say some might not have time to listen to your message as a preacher. Some might not have time uh, to come and worship, but if you leave a word or if you leave a textbook or if you leave a book with them, one way or the other they'll be tempted to look at it. Maybe one day they'll be tempted to even read the first page. You don't know what happens next time they are tempted to even read the whole book. At least you would have left something. Our sermons, they expire. Why do I say they expire? Because we might not preach them a time and again. But as for the book, the message that you write on a paper, it will not expire. Neither will it retire. Even for the generations to come, they will still read that message and understand it as vivid as you wrote it. Allow me to say to you, my brothers and sisters, you might sing, you might preach, you might speak as much as you want. But as long as you do not put it into paper, as long as you do not write it down, it might not make sense. So the call to go and witness, to go therefore, is not only a call to preachers, it's not only a call for pastors, it's not only a call for deacons and elders, but it is a call even for writers, for everyone, every member of the church. At some point when they brought a sinner to Jesus, Jesus does not waste time communicating with them using verbal language. He bowed down and started to write. As they read the message, the Bible that I read tells me that one by one they left. Just imagine if you had left, maybe you're working at an organization. You write down a message, you leave it with them. One day they might read it. Maybe you, you, you leave that workplace, but you leave a certain paper that talks about your relationship with God, that talks about maybe it's the book of the year. You just leave it there. One day somebody might be tempted to read it. And allow me to challenge you, or allow me to say this to you. One by one, you are see them coming to you and asking you, where did you get this book from? And then you refer them to your place of worship. One by one, they'll come to you and asking, this message, it's timely. Where did you get this message? And you refer them to the Savior who blessed you. You refer them to the Savior who gave you the message. You refer them to the Savior who even gave you the gift of writing. I want to pray with somebody this morning, my brothers and sisters. We're saying, Pastor, I am a writer. But at some point, I had not understood my call as a writer. Maybe I looked at myself and thought I'm useless. Maybe I'm just useful to the world out there and forgot that in evangelism I'm also needed as a writer. If you are there, I just want to pray with you. I want to pray with a second group of people who are saying, no, we are not writers. But the book is being distributed, the book of the year. If I cannot go and preach, I cannot go maybe and uh, share the little that I have, or maybe I don't even have what to share. But you're saying, Pastor, God helping me, I want to share even the book of the year. I want to spread it. I want to carry it around. Maybe I'm not gifted in talking, but at least the, the, the book of the year will say my message as loud and clear as I would have said if I was a gifted preacher. 
I want to pray with that group. And I want to pray with the third group, which is saying, Pastor, maybe we have done all other things, but we have forgotten that there is a work in publishing. We also want to be involved, maybe in writing articles that will lead the world to Christ. Maybe newspaper articles. Maybe we want to write poems that will lead people to Christ. It's all about publishing. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I just want to write statements or statuses that will lead people to a savior who is willing to use even publishers, who is willing to use writers, who is willing to use authors, and who is willing to use the publishing department for the greater good of the gospel. If you are there, we are praying. Our Father who is in heaven, we come before your throne this morning as it is a day of publishing where some of us will be taking part in distributing the book of the year. We could not be gifted in preaching and singing, but we thank you, Father, for the platform of sharing at least a book, which will speak even years after we have departed from this earth. I'm praying also, Father, for those that have been writers, authors, but they've remained hidden under the carpets of this world. They have remained hidden thinking that their gift is not useful in your house of worship. Father, give them the courage, give them the confidence to write something for you, to write something for the sake of the gospel, to write something for the sake of, the, of evangelism. Father, may you bless them and may you use them as you wish. We are also praying for the department as a whole, that you open avenues that will make them in inclusive, or that will make them allow everyone who is into writing, into authorship, to be used by you. We are also praying, Lord, for those that will be reached by the words that will be on the paper, the words that will be written, the words that will be spread on newspapers, on social media platforms. Father, we ask for the spirit of transformation where we cannot reach. May our words, may our books, our papers, may it reach far and wide. Be with us today and forevermore. Amen. May the good Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word.
started for the kingdom since my life he controls since I gave my heart to Supplying plenteous grace, he bestows every day. My way gets praised. The sweet time grows. Hallelujah.
Yeah.